It's Phil's Pop Culture Podcast. Watching television, watching television. A dynamite place to be. Dynamite! Sponsored by Vandalay Industries, importers and exporters of fine latex products since 1992. And now, the man who taught Frank Burns how to eat worms, here's your host, Phil Kahn. And thank you, John Meany, wherever you are. As Mr. Meany stated, this is indeed Phil's Pop Culture Podcast, and I'm your host, Phil Kahn. I'm extremely excited to introduce today's guest. Professionally, he's known as Robert R. Schaefer. In his personal life, he prefers Bobby Ray. But perhaps you know him best for the character he played on the hit TV show, The Office, Bob Vance, Vance Refrigeration. I recently conducted an extremely fun interview with Bobby Ray, filled with lots of laughs and interesting insights into his life and career that I think you'll really enjoy. Let's listen together to our highly entertaining chat. Hi, Bobby Ray. Thanks so much for being on the program today. Oh, my God. Phil Kahn. This this is the privilege of a lifetime. I, I'm honored. <laughs> and I didn't feed you that line at all. That's just right, right from the heart, isn't it? Uh, you know, that's on the cue sheet. <laughs> <laughs> Don't spoil my little secret. I don't know. It is, it's a privilege to talk to you. Are you in New York right now? Upstate New York. We got 17 inches of snow yesterday. I saw some pictures. It looks positively chilly. <laughs> oh, <laughs> this morning it was minus nine when I drove to work. So where are you, L.A. right now? I'm in Studio City, California. The sun is shining and uh, it's another perfect L.A. day. Oh yeah, rub it in. Thanks. Oh no, I know. I don't. I'll send you the pictures of the palm trees and the breeze later. Yeah, please do. <laughs> I forgot what they look like. There's girls at the beach today. Okay, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> uh, oh, thanks. Rub it. In. You're really rubbing it in now. Yeah, I should have gone down there, but you know, I had this uh, appointment with you, so priorities. Yeah, absolutely. But when I'm when I'm done with you, I'll let you go out and hang out with the babes by the pool. Uh, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of that going on. <laughs> now, you moved around a lot during your childhood. You were born in Charleston, West Virginia. You lived in Bowie, Maryland, graduated high school in Michigan, attended Brower College in Florida, and then moved to L.A. in 1980 to pursue your acting career. Boy, you were quite the vagabond. Well, <laughs> vagabond is a good choice of words there, I think. Now, looking back on it, of course, at the time, I was just a kid doing what they told me to do and go where they told me to go. Yeah. Uh, my uh, my mother remarried. My father died, so we moved away from West Virginia when my mother remarried, and, uh, and my stepfather was a contractor of, uh, with the military, or the government, actually. And so those would explain some of those locations there. But it was a good uh, experience as a kid because you uh, constantly had to adapt <laughs> and make oh, new yeah. friends. You know, it, uh, it, it helps your confidence. I know some people... Uh, shy away for her, claim it's a tough life to constantly be moving around, but I think it's a, it's an advantage, actually. So is that kind of how you caught the acting bug, is the fact that moving around, you had to, you know, adapt and adjust, et cetera? Well, no, I never caught the acting bug until I lived in Los Angeles, and I was living with an actress, and uh, I was sort of shuffling around for what I was going to do. I, I was doing some modeling, and... I was too tall for that game, and I didn't really like it. <laughs> oh, why not? Uh, well, like I said, it, you know, it's uh, uh, some of the same things that Harvey Weinstein was doing to uh, women in Los Angeles were happening to me as a male model. So, oh, uh, <laughs> so all the women were treating you like uh, the piece of meat that you are? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> no, no, it wasn't the women. <laughs> oh. <laughs> It was the dude. Oh, no. So, no, you know, sure you're flattered, Phil, but, you know, at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> at the same time. So I got into acting. I went to uh, this really prestigious acting class here in Los Angeles. My, some of my classmates were, I'm, I'm name dropping on you now, pal. Please. Uh, Meg, Meg Ryan was in my class. Uh -huh. Eric Stoltz, Nick Cage. 
Christopher Penn. Wow. On and on and on and on. So it was very competitive and uh, very, it was deadly serious business. And that's one thing I think has really been lost is the training that goes into this profession. Because, uh, you know, I liken it to playing golf or being a baseball player. You need a repeatable swing, right? And yeah. acting is the same thing. So the foundation of building a character. You know, I'm an old school Stanislavski actor studio guy. Yep. So uh, there's a method to the madness. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it, it served me well, certainly, over the years, you know, because there's a lot of times you're, uh, you, there's not so much time for acting. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you just got, you got to get the shot. So that's really what it comes down to. Can you, can you prepare everything and execute the shots when the pressure's on? I, I remember I was shooting a movie and uh, there was this really extreme close up. And so I could not move more than an inch to either side or up or down, right? And I said to the director, man, I'm not sure if I can take all this pressure. And he looks at me and goes, uh, we hired you because you can take the pressure. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. That was a valuable lesson right there. It's like, yeah, you know, I was just being facetious. Yeah. Uh, because I, I, you know, I really believe in as much stillness as you can generate uh, when you're on film, as opposed to you know people nodding, their, moving their heads and shaking their. And you know, when you're shooting in close up, you have to be, you have to still everything down. <laughs> it, I, you may have heard of the thing when you're having fights in movies. Mm-hmm. Every done at 75 percent right so you don't go you don't go full hundred percent because that's when people get hurt yep so you think just slows down a little bit and it's the same thing when you're working in close-up everything gets smaller and you know much more refined so it's learning to create that inner life uh because all the action is in the eyes everything else is extraneous to what's happening in the eyes so you can only portray that if, if you created the character and and here I am expounding about acting on and on and on, and I promised I wasn't going to do it. <laughs> no, really, that's all I wanted to talk about. That and uh, golf. It's funny that you mentioned uh, golf. You're a 10 handicap, apparently, and and the fact that you likened your uh, getting your acting chops is the same as kind of perfecting your golf game. Interesting that you have that comparison there. Well, the golf game, uh, it requires the same a lot of the same things that acting requires which is that you are aware an audience is watching you but you don't give a damn Ah, right yeah you still have to you still have to make the swing think of the pressure these guys are on out there on sunday on the pga tour putting for a million dollars you know that pressure (laughs) (laughs) that's real pressure right there and you don't want to embarrass yourself you know that's the key element there like do not let me screw this up so uh those disciplines are pretty pretty well the same and again the key is the preparation beforehand how much how well did you prepare for it Uh, i'm getting ready to play in a quote-unquote celebrity tournament at this really exclusive course here in newport beach called pelican hill it's terrifying when i look at the pictures (laughs) (laughs) because it's on the ocean and there's heavy wind coming in off that pacific and uh, i haven't been playing a lot i've been putting a lot but i haven't been swinging the clubs much and so I was out there practicing this morning from the same theorem. I, I don't want to embarrass myself. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny. You mentioned Newport Beach. My sister Cindy lives in Newport Beach, and she's quite the golfer. I may have to uh, have her come out and coach you a little bit or at least cheer you on. Yeah, that'd be great. You know, you should probably do that right now while it's minus nine in, uh, in upstate New York. That would be my advice. <laughs> I told you not to rub it in that it's freezing cold and we just had 17 inches of snow, but you did it anyway. It even with the heated floors and the fireplaces burning. So, uh, <laughs> no, I, I, again, you you want to play well, and the same thing happens now for me on any set that I go on, because I'm Bob Vance from The Office. Yes, and everybody knows it. Absolutely, and they're expecting. They're, you know, they, everybody gathers around when I get ready to work. They want to see what I'm bringing, what I'm going to do. Sure. Yeah. I, am I, you know, and I've never walked through a part in my life, you know, so I'm always trying to bring the very best. And, uh, but it's been, a, it's been an interesting uh, transition. Uh, I can imagine because you were more or less a character actor. You've appeared in like every movie and TV show ever, it seems like. And then 
you finally got this big break. How, we're talking, of course, about the character. I want you to introduce yourself as the character, by the way. So could you do that? Hi, I'll say, hi, I'm Phil Kahn. Nice to meet you. I'm Bob Vance, Vance Refrigeration. <laughs> I just wish I got paid every time I said it, but I guess I have in many respects. Well, well, you did get, well, how you and I connected, first of all, to take a step back, was you did get paid. You're, you're on a website. It's cameo.com, and you can get video shout-outs from various celebrities, and I actually connected with you by getting a video shout-out. Why don't you tell folks more about that little, little side gig? I've been doing it about six weeks. They contacted me and asked me if I wanted to do it, and I thought, ah, oh, this is... This is interesting. I mean, I watched a few of them on there. And I say, sure, you know, I'll do it. And uh, as you said, we get paid. <laughs> <laughs> but the production value is good. You know, I'm sorry about the lighting on that video. I was self-taping. My cameraman wasn't here. Um, and, of course, I didn't have makeup and hair done either. But, you know, the, the lighting, i got to work on the lighting. I've got <laughs> yeah, that. you're going to have to re-record it for me. I, I really hated it. No, just kidding. It was awesome. Oh, you gave me five stars. Come on. And, and it led to this podcast. And I, you know, the biggest privilege of my career, as I said earlier. <laughs> I, I think it's great because people, what they ask you to do is say happy birthday, happy anniversary, wish them luck moving. You know, the dog died. I mean, there's all kinds of these incredible intimacies that are shared with, uh, you know, strangers, the people who respect this character. And, you know, Bob is a straight shooter, and that's the same way I approach the, the uh, the shout outs that I do for people. And, and so far it seems to really be making people happy and, uh, why not do it? That's great. Absolutely. And you do it right. The funny thing is I've purchased a few shout outs on there and you know, they've been all been very good, but people say, well, hi Phil, uh, happy holidays to you, but you really did it up right. You have the office theme song playing in the background. You've got your office hat on in the background. You've got the Vance refrigeration sign. I was like, wow, this, this guy really went all out to do it right. And I loved it. Well, that sign was smuggled. <laughs> <laughs> that sign was smuggled. You know, it's funny. I didn't smuggle it, but someone smuggled it and gave it to me. Oh, that's and, funny. Uh, it, they just sold one of them. NBC sold all kinds of stuff from the show at these auctions. Uh -huh. And I think, for 2800 bucks, so I'm like, all right, I got three grand there because I'll sign that. <laughs> <laughs> so if things really get bad, I can sell you. You know, I'll give it to you for 2500 How's that sound? <laughs> Deal. <laughs> Deal. Oh, all right, all right. Uh, hang on, I'll get your address. <laughs> all right, off the air, we'll do it. Now, if it's okay, Bobby Ray, I'd love to play a clip of the shout-out you did for me. Okay. Hi, Phil Kahn. Bob Vance, Vance Refrigeration. Listen, Phil, if you ever set foot in Scranton, Pennsylvania again and try to outbid me for a hug from Phyllis, then me and the five families will have to take care of you if you catch my drift. Just kidding, Phil. Stay away from Phyllis. <laughs> I love it. That was so great, and I thank you so much for doing it. So, folks, if you go and visit cameo.com, and you can get Bobby Ray to do a shout out for you. Now it's funny, your professional name is Robert Schaefer, but you prefer Bobby Ray? Well, it's an interesting story. I mean, if you look at my IMDB page, uh, I probably have more misspellings of my last name than any actor in history. Uh -huh. uh, Bobby Ray started out when I did these uh, films called Psycho Cop. Yeah. I'll have uh, a separate identity for Psycho Cop. And then I'll be Robert in all the straight stuff. But the horror film guy, I'll be Bobby Ray. So then, after some time went by, you know, the, the films became cult uh, phenoms in a way. They just, they just uh, issued, uh, reissued uh, Psycho Cop Returns uh, on Blu-ray. And it's just beautiful to see it in that condition. Absolutely. Oh, no, it's great. And, you know, uh, so I thought, well... At a certain point, I was thinking, Tommy Lee Jones, Billy Bob Thornton. That seems to be working for them. <laughs> so I'm a, I don't know any Bobby Rays, but I know a lot of Robert Ray, uh, Roberts. And uh, so I decided to go with Bobby Ray full-time because it was associated with my biggest work to date. And I've kept it as Bobby Ray the whole time. It's just that IMDb and 
you know, SAG lists me as Robert R., and it's too late to correct all these mistakes from the past with my name. But <laughs> as long as they pay me, right, that's what they say. Exactly. Who, who cares what they call you as long as they pay you? Well, my agents were uh, dead set against me changing the name at that time. They were like, no, let's just stick with Robert because everybody's going to think you're from Texas, right? Yeah. So that, that's going to limit you. And I'm like, I don't, you know, if it's going to limit me, <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll take my chances. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of your big break, how did you land the role on The Office as Bob Vance, Vance Refrigeration? Well, I auditioned for Allison Jones, and this is a funny story because I, it was at five. The audition was at five p.m. in Hollywood, right? Yeah. Our studio. So, I go. I leave. I you know live about fifteen minutes away, and so I give myself a half an hour to get there and park. And as I'm going into Hollywood, there's traffic everywhere. I'm like, what is up? You know, because there's always traffic everywhere, but it's usually unusually bad, unusually thick. And I don't know what it is until I get there. And all of a sudden, I see all these people in costumes uh, parading around, and it's the Halloween parade. I didn't even know it was Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> but they're having Halloween, uh, you know, it's a, it makes Mardi Gras look like a picnic, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, it gets pretty wild. So now I can't find any place to park. I, finally, I run into the, uh, make it into the office. I'm 20 minutes late. I'm the last guy of the day. They're waiting for me, so... I'm thinking, oh, this sucks. I'm pouring sweat. <laughs> <laughs> but I, 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 I do, I do the reading, and uh, I know it's good. And a couple weeks later, uh, oh, well, the addendum to the uh, Halloween story is when I come out of the office. Yeah. There's these three girls standing there, and they're dressed as angels, right? And they have these magic wands, and all of a sudden they start tapping me with the wands, and they're dancing around me and everything. I'm like, wow, this might be a good omen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's never happened to me before, you know, so uh, not that I haven't had girls dancing around, but they weren't angels, if you know what I mean. <laughs> so anyway, and there may have been an exchange of dollar uh, bills in that previous circumstance. But, uh, <laughs> I wasn't going to say it, but you said it. Okay. Um, I find this place is extremely sad. Um, yeah. So, so a couple of weeks later, uh, I'm thinking, well, I haven't heard anything from him, and so it's probably gone. But I, I did ask the agent, I said, hey, look into that. And so they called me back. He said, ah, who cares about that show? That's not going to be around. Um, we we were up for something else, uh, you know, going to a callback on something else, and they were waiting to hear on that. Oh. And they were more excited about that. I forget what it was. But then we got a call for a callback, and I went in, and Phyllis was there, mm -hmm. and the uh, director of the episode was there. And... Uh, they put me through a ton of improv, and I really didn't have much idea about who this character was whatsoever. So, you know, you just do yourself at that point. Yeah. Trying to be funny. <laughs> <laughs> just start something in there. You know, just feel, you feel like you're flailing away because there's no response. You know? Right, right. You so, don't know whether they're loving you or hating you or whatever. Right. Uh, they're not sitting there just, you know, busting out laughing on everything you're doing. Yeah. So uh, I think the next day after that callback, I was on the set. And uh, I was shooting. Oh, that that's terrific. Yeah, it was because it, you know it was a life changer. It was a it was uh, that's how I look at parts now. Is it a life changer or is it just another gig, right? Right. And life changers don't come around too often. I really loved the way that they introduced the character. Uh, Phyllis brings you to a holiday party and she introduces you to. Uh, Kevin Stanley and Ryan, and of course you say your famous line, Hi, Bob Vance, Vance Refrigeration. Hi, Bob Vance, Vance Refrigeration. Hi, Bob Vance, Vance Refrigeration. And then after an awkward pause, Ryan says, So, uh, what line of work are you in, Bob? <laughs> well, the best part was that Ryan didn't, Ryan cracked on the first take. He, he, I busted him up. He didn't make it through the first take. Oh. So, there's the, that is actually, I think, on one of the outtakes. I've never seen it, but, um, the the key, like all good comedy, is rhythm, right? You're searching for a rhythm. That's what makes sitcom writing, especially. Although the office isn't really sitcom, but sitcom writing is is geared to you know set up, set up, punchline, or you know it's a triplicate usually. Yeah. Uh, so you're just searching for that rhythm, and we found it there, and it was really the director uh, Charles McDougall, Scottish gentleman, said that you know they they should all sound the same. So that was what we were going for there. Ah. So that the, inton the intonation wasn't changing. 
you know, Bob is aware, obviously, that the cameras are there. Yeah. And so that's kind of the the, the trick in it, right? Uh, yeah. In true, in true cinema verite, or real cinema for you Frenchophobes. Thanks for uh, translating. <laughs> True cinema ter- uh, verite, you have to not be aware of the presence of the camera. You cannot know that a camera's watching. Right. Because that alters, uh, cameras alter behavior. So that's really the trick to the whole game is uh, can you fake real behavior? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Never thought of it that way. While the cameras are watching. So. Yeah, yeah. Must have been a blast to play the role. It, it was, it wasn't, it had its, you know, it had its good, it had its ups and downs, like everything. I mean, you want more action. You know, when I was a basketball player, I mean, I wanted in the game. I didn't want to be sitting on the bench. Ah. So, but you also have to recognize, listen, this is a big ensemble piece. And, uh, you know, be grateful for what you get, you know, at the same time, the human spirit is going more and more and more. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> So you got a little taste of it, and, and you wanted to gorge yourself, huh? Well, uh, sure. I mean, yeah. when, when I was given the opportunity, I seized on it. You know, I made, I think I really made something out of nothing, you know, because Bob could have been a one-shot deal, and I yeah. knew that going. And so I said to myself, how can I make this guy recur? How can I bring this guy back? What can I do? So quite early on, I determined that I was just going to uh, – love Phyllis as much as humanly possible. Uh-huh. Uh, I wanted it to be like first love. Uh-huh. In other words, when, you, when you're in your first lo- true love affair in junior high or high school, you don't have eyes for anyone but that the object of your affection. True. There's not, you know, it's not like, like being an actor in Hollywood. Every time you look up, here's another starlet coming around the bend, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, you, there's a, a, a focus and, I wanted to put her up on a pedestal. And so what we essentially created was this great love story that was true love. And, you know, it was passionate. It was, you know, they were nasty little sex beasts, really. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so they were the most unlikely couple on the office to have what everybody else was trying to get. Yep. They already had it, you know. So that was... uh but again, you're at the mercy of the writers on, on network television. Sure. You know, I can have an idea of what I think Bob does. And so I never took a drink uh, of any kind in any of the parties. I would always make sure I had Coke. Bob didn't drink in my mind. I was like, ah. no, he does not drink. Interesting. And then all of a sudden, next thing I know, I was on safari in Africa. I got drunk. I ran over a kid. It, you know, <laughs> I said the seat. <laughs> outside the country next thing i know you know bob is he a member of the mafia he blew out of the grand jury i mean so (laughs) my idea of who this guy was and who you know sometimes the joke you know the the, uh, one joke can change the whole uh your whole understanding of who you think you're playing as opposed to writers you know it's a laugh so they want the laugh they'll go for the laugh Oh, it's too bad here you wanted to have a rich full backstory and they ruined it for gags well, they gave me enough. You know, I, I decided, you know, when I heard the line, uh, Phyllis says in a talking head, we'd go out to bars. And uh, when guys look at uh, my cleavage, Bob beats them up. <laughs> 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 All right, I'll embrace that. I can go with that. I can work with any dude staring at my girl's cleavage is going to get a thumping. So uh, <laughs> that is a fact. And uh <laughs> You know, you just got to dissuade them usually with uh, with a little talk first, you know, like quit looking at her. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> you staring at my lady's jugs, huh? <laughs> well, that's what I loved about the shout out. I don't know if you remember the you've been doing a lot of them. I don't know if you know the exact one, but I wrote like a little script for you. And uh, it was kind of like you threatening me for uh, for trying to outbid you for Phyllis uh, for a hug. And then you're like, stay away from Phyllis. Don't do it. Yeah, that's right. That's Stay right. away. <laughs> I got the message. Believe me. <laughs> now, I could talk all day long about Bob Vance, um, but I want to talk about another project. One of the After you gave me the shout out, you sent me an email about another project you're working on, and I took a look at it, and the film is called Dick 
Dixter. And I saw, I saw that title, and I'm like, oh, i got to check this out right away. And I sat there and watched it from beginning to end right away. Why don't you tell the folks about that project? Well, Dick Dixter is um, a Hollywood director. He's uh, a guy who thinks he's uh, an artist, but he's really a pathetic drunk. And he's guilty of everything, and everybody hates him. And so we went on a wild uh, comic ride. The picture really came about. One morning, I was going to instead of the office, and uh, Kevin uh, would sometimes stop there. We'd both grab Starbucks and head, head to the set, right, 5 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. And uh, one day, I go in there to get some coffee, and uh, the girl, the barista, she says, hey, hang on a second. I got, I got a gift for you. I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> so she goes out to her car, and she comes back in, and she hands me uh, a DVD. It's the porn version of The Office. Oh, that's great. Yeah, and I'm like, what is this? <laughs> <laughs> it, it's the porn version of The Office. I'm like, there's, there's this, such a thing? And and she goes, yeah, but, you know, it's not Michael as the boss. It's Michelle's the boss in this version. <laughs> <laughs> like, well, why do you have this? And she's, uh, she said, well, my, my husband directed it. Oh, that's funny. Really? Okay. So that's interesting, right? That, so I take the I take the porn version into the set. And everybody looks at it. And we're all like, "We've made it! Forget that Emmy. This porn version of us. This proves <laughs> <laughs> we have really made it now. Forget the Emmy." So then I had the occasion. I worked. I did a KFC commercial, uh, and the director of the spot was David O. Russell, of, you know, famous for Three Kings and Silver Linings Playbook. I mean, yeah. big Hollywood. Oscar nominated director. And he's a bit of a fear monger. You know, he's a throwback to old uh, Hollywood directors who like to intimidate. And uh, he's had some famous fights with George Clooney. They, they punched it out. Oh. There's a tape, uh, there's a YouTube video of him uh, just tearing Lily Tomlin apart. I mean, I can't even repeat what he said. But it was interesting because he changed the uh, tone, you know, the Everybody's walking on eggshells around this guy. Nobody wants to set him off, right? Yeah. So I thought, well, you know, this is kind of an interesting, because I've worked with, uh, you know, maybe 200 directors or more in my career. So, you know, they all bring something different to them, uh, to, to the proceedings, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of them are great, and, you know, some of them are in love with the idea of being a director, right? Yep. And I have a lot of friends who are independent film directors. It's one of the toughest jobs in the world. It's usually five years between movies, and they lose. They get the money, they lose the money. They have the script, they have the actor. You know, things fall apart at the last second. Yeah. So it's an incredibly, <laughs> it's an incredibly difficult job, right? Unless you had a hundred million dollar line of credit from Chase Manhattan. <laughs> uh, making movies is no picnic. It's you know, it's it's tough, tough sledding. Yeah. And uh, you know, but they all think that they could be Michael Bay directing the $200 million film, right? Yeah. So, so it, 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 there has to be a certain trait in someone who make what well, makes them want to be a film director. And one of the first films I, I really fell in love with when I got in the, in the business was uh, a film with Peter O'Toole as the, as the director, Eli Cross in, in the movie is entitled the stunt man. And it's phenomenal. And Peter O'Toole is the director. <laughs> <laughs> well, he, He's pretty much got every trick in the book, right? Yeah. You know, when he's trying, to, he's trying to get a performance out of, uh, and he's sort of manipulating people. I mean, it's an amazing movie. Uh, young Barbara Hershey and Stephen Railsback, who had just come off of playing Manson as the lead actor. Yeah, oh, it. yeah. Yeah, you, you check that out if you get a chance. I will. And uh, so that character had always kind of been swirling around. So uh, I started writing it, and... Uh, then I realized uh, I've written 60 pages of it, and then I put it away for a while. And then I came back to it after The Office ended because I wanted to make a mockumentary version of it. So I figured out a way to um, – I shot that movie, Phil, in six days, just so you know. Wow. Uh, yeah, six days. Uh, so the, the key thing that I always had uh, was talent. Right. I yeah. knew I could get all my friends and acquaintances to come and be in the movie. So I have first I have top shelf. I have, you know, the best actors in the world are at my disposal here in Hollywood. And they all committed completely to making the piece. And, you know, I love uh, farce because it's just so ridiculous. 
Uh, and I was really looking for more pace. Uh, you know, I like uh, Christopher Guest makes movies about entertainment business. You know, uh, the big picture is a great one. And also uh, Waiting for Guffman. And oh, I love Waiting for Guffman. That was awesome. Also, for your, for your consideration was a factor in it as well. Yeah. If you've ever seen that, that's a terrific film about uh, about this little low budget movie where someone thinks that she's going to win an Oscar. <laughs> Catherine right. O'Hara. So, <laughs> right. Yeah, you know, they all get the, uh, 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 so it's crazy, right? They have no no idea about winning an Oscar. So a lot of that kind of all filtered in. And also I've been, you know, I've, when I got into the business, I really uh, dove all the way in. You know, I read all the biographies of great directors. I saw their doc, the documentaries about them, you know. Um, and I lived across from Rocket, the store on Melrose and La Brea called Rocket Video. So every day I was in there watching an old movie, every day, you know. Mm. learning the business by watching films. Sure. And so it all it all sort of coalesced into this Dick Dixter, this crazy bastard. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I realized, Phil, I, I made a Me Too movie before there was even a Me Too. Yeah, that's true. I didn't think of it that way, but you're right. Well, the whole thing is predicated on his crime that happened on his movie set, Cult of Doom in Arkansas in 1989. Yeah. It's alleged that he raped a girl there uh, on that movie set, his, his leading lady. And so it's actually a revenge plot, you know, because, uh, well, I don't want to spoil it for anybody, but, you know, so so the film, while being a farce, also works at, you know, on a plot level and also, you know, just on an absurd level. I mean, just the people's names, for instance, Sammy Davis Jr. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I caught that. I'm like, hmm, is that a takeoff of Sammy Davis? That, that happened because I was working, you know, I, I did this movie with Tim Russ, directed by Christopher Ray, directed Dick Dixter, and that's kind of how the project came together. We were doing a movie called Asteroid versus Earth. And, I, oh, you missed that one? <laughs> I, I, I didn't see that one. I'm sorry. <laughs> that one, did you? Well, I saved the world, okay? You're welcome. Yeah, oh, thanks. Yeah, yeah, U.S. Navy, uh, Lieutenant Commander Rouse, that saved, saved the world there. Uh, <laughs> but it's funny because Tim Ross and I, you know, we'd had the same manager, but I'd never met him. And uh, there we were. He was playing the captain of the ship. And uh, we were on the USS Iowa, which uh, is, is quite a quite a boat to get on, believe me. Mm. Uh, the the power of a battleship, I mean, it's, it's kind of stunning. Uh so anyway, Tim says, uh, hey, has anybody ever told you that you could play Rodney Dangerfield? And I'm like, huh, what? <laughs> <laughs> no, no way can I play Rodney Dangerfield. He's like, oh, no, you could, you could. And I'm like, I don't know, I don't know about that. that. That would be really tough, you know. I mean, that's scary to even think about attempting it, right? Yeah. Historical years and someone with that much uh, recent <laughs> footage. <laughs> right, right. right. So, I mean, it's intimidating, right? I mean, it's one thing, I, I obviously, uh, John T. Riley's playing uh, Hardy right now, right? Yep. In, in uh, Laurel and Hardy. Right. And there's a great, there's a great book about uh, Laurel uh, recently came out called He. If you get a chance, check that out, because it's written from Laurel's sort of a first-person voice, really. It's, it's quite an amazing. Michael Connelly, is, I think, is the Not Michael Connelly, John Connelly is the writer. So, I mean, Hardy is less present in our subconscious or conscious than than uh danger feel <laughs> yeah. so yeah you know and there's and, and, that, and that footage has, has achieved an archival quality right because it's so primitive uh that old studio film mm -hmm. i mean the, their jokes just as fabulous now as they as they were then even funnier really i think because they were truly talented comedians i mean geniuses really they they said they wrote so many of the rules for the comedy game um so I look at Tim Russ and uh, I said, hey, has anybody ever, could, do you think you could do Sammy Davis Jr.? <laughs> <laughs> he goes, what? What, what the hell? <laughs> <laughs> so once, once I uh, had him in mind, you know, to play the manager, he's Dick's man, his long-suffering manager. And uh, once I had him in mind, you know, uh, really we were just trying to do every single Hollywood cliche possible. Sure. If you're gonna go over the top, might as well go all the way, right? Oh, there's no holding back. <laughs> <laughs> as you, we pull no punches. As you could, you know, and that's the way comedy should be. There's no, there's no safe spaces in comedy. If there is, it's the wrong kind of comedy, and it sucks. 
<laughs> so it sounds like it was a lot of fun putting that. Where can people see this? Dick Dixter. Oh, Dick Dixie's playing. Every, it's streaming everywhere right now. It's on Amazon. It's on iTunes. It's on Google. It's on YouTube. It's on Redbox. It's on Fandango. It's on Stream. It's on Vudu. I may have left one out. I, th I think you hit everything. Is it on Netflix? No, not yet. You know, it streams first, and the Netflix deal is a separate deal. Ah. So it, that comes down the road. I think probably you'll have uh, cable television will probably be the next uh venue for it ah, and you're trying all you can to promote it and uh, and i'm going to put it on my social media pages and i have a pop culture podcast facebook page i'll be sure to do what little i can or excuse me that sounds like i'm going to do nothing for you no i'll try to do what i can in my own little way is i guess what i'm trying to say kind of, that's kind of what i was banking on and i you know think the distributors were as well i when i saw the artwork for the for dick dickster um you know, there was a tagline, see Bob Vance from the office like never before. Yeah. And I'm like, why well, hell, I should have gotten nude in this movie. Then it would have really, really <laughs> sold this film. You know, it would have been big. It would have been huge, as they like to say. <laughs> but I'm not naked, and I don't want to kill any possible potential business. Uh, do you think people are actually listening to this nonsense? <laughs> uh, I hope not. After you just said the thing about nudity, I, you know, I, I, I'm sure people just clicked it off when they heard that. <laughs> well, here's a little known fact for your listeners. Okay. Uh, Bob and my grandmother. <laughs> In Hollywood, when you do love scenes, you're not nude, obviously, unless maybe the angle requires some part form of it, right? Yeah. So it's the hardest thing ever, no pun intended, for uh, for an actor to do because you're supposed to be playing arousal, right? Yeah. But it's considered extremely bad form to actually become aroused. Yes. <laughs> In other words, don't get wood. Uh, so <laughs> I'm sitting there, I'm going through the statistics of the 1969 Washington Senators, Frank Howard at first base. <laughs> 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 right, right, right. <laughs> yeah, a really a Rodriguez a shortstop. <laughs> yeah, Ted Williams was the manager. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Ted Williams was the manager, that's right. <laughs> now, you strike me, even though this is the first time we've spoken, you strike me as the kind of guy that would have struggled with that little rule. Am I right? What's that? Well, oh, with being aroused? Yeah. No, no. no. I mean, I did a few... Uh, I did these little movies back in the day for Playboy Channel. Huh? And, yeah, it was called Director's Showcase. And so, again, my buddies were all directors, and they were like, who's stupid enough? Who can we get that's stupid enough <laughs> <laughs> to take his clothes off, right? And I was like, I'll do it. So, uh, <laughs> here, but the great thing was is that I was writing these, uh, you know, we were doing short films. So I was writing these 10 to 15-minute films and producing them. And... Uh, the one requirement was that there had to be a love scene in it and had, you know, featuring the girl. They don't want to see the dudes. Right, right? right. So they see your bare ass or something like that. But uh, it was great experience. And, I, you know, I remember one time, I, I think Psycho Cop Returns had been playing on cable. And so somebody came up to me and they were like, hey, uh, wow, I just caught your work the other day on TV. It was great. I'm thinking, uh, well, you know, we had a lot of fun playing that crazy cop. And he was no, no, Playboy Channel. <laughs> <I'm> like, oh. <laughs> You think they're talking about Joe Vickers, but they're talking about uh, whatever poor name you must use. Like movie star, and then all of a sudden I was, you know, uh, sort of a, what do they call it? Skinamax. I was, I was doing Skinamax. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I love those movies. So, who's the hottest babe you ever uh, quote unquote slept with in a movie? Oh, Kathleen Kinmont was pretty hot. Oh, she is hot. Uh, it's a movie called The Corporate Ladder, and in the opening of the film, I'm her boss, and I rape her, and then she kills me, right? So. Uh, but I, and like I said, I, I rape her in the opening scene, and you know, I'm shouting, I'm saying stuff like, ah, you knew what was going to happen today. I gave you this job. Now come here. <laughs> <laughs> it's time to thank Daddy, because you're nothing but a lousy secretary without me. <laughs> it was great because I was, you know, I was going through the motion. We'd throw her down on this table and get on top of her and all this. And uh, between takes, she was actually coming over and thanking me. You know, she's like, that was great. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, I know it was great. It was really great. Let's do it again. So, uh, you know, there's been a, a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of actresses are, you know, uh, kind of like being around thoroughbreds, right? And you never can really trust them or understand them. So it's best not to try. <laughs> I've actually sworn off of actresses. I, I just say no now. What do you do? Uh, I'm like, no. <laughs> too funny. You know, they're, uh, they're skittish, right? I, and this was actually, uh, Cloris Leachman said this to me one time at a party at her house. She's talking about actresses. She said, they're like thoroughbreds. Give them the sugar, then give them the whip. Oh, <laughs> I love that. <laughs> good advice. That is good advice. Oh, that is really good advice. So tell me, before I, two more things before I let you go, because uh, I want to cut this short and go check out all those Playboy movies you're talking about. You're kind of getting me uh, excited there, but... I don't, I don't believe they're they're anywhere to be found. Oh come on! No, actually, on my YouTube channel, there's one called Connie. It's on my on Bobby Ray Schaefer YouTube, and that that's a nice little arty piece. And you'll like the girl in it, Karen Cachier was her name. She was a playmate of the year. Ooh. So she, yeah, no, she was a she was a top show. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I guess I'll have to settle for that. There's probably no nudity. Oh no, there no, it's we no no the, there's there's glimpses of well Carol. <laughs> oh, I just want to make sure I don't see your naked ass. No no, you don't get to see me naked. I think I'm shirtless in it, but that's about it. <laughs> well anyway, what what's been your favorite role to date? Has it been uh, Bob Vance or is it something else? Well, it would be Dick Dixter because I wrote it. I produced it, I starred in it, I edited it, I chose the music for it, chose all the backgrounds for it, to cast it. You know, I did everything. I raised the money, uh, I sold it. So uh, as far as a complete deal, it's Dick Dixter. But obviously Bob Vance, Vance Refrigeration, no one had any idea. We were on a show that was getting ready to be canceled. It was the lowest rated after the first season in NBC's history. I came in season two, episode 10, Christmas Party, we were talking about the introductions earlier. Yep. And that very next day, um, we were picked up for the remainder of the season. And from that point on, it snowballed into this huge phenomenon. Uh, a lot of the cast was interacting on MySpace. <laughs> That's going back. Oh, God, that is going back. I No, I realized so the other day, you know, I've been saying Bob Vance, Vance Refrigeration, for 14 years. Oh, my God. It has been that long. It's 14 years. 2005 was when I came into the show. Oh, my God. It's been that long. I, I, I've been 14 years. Time flies. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> obviously, Bob Vance, Vance Refrigerator, because the office is more popular now than when it was on the air. It's so true. I talked to so many people that said they never watched it in its original run, but now they're watching it and, the, and they're hooked. They, they can't get enough. Uh, they're all binge watching. Yeah. I went to uh, Scranton, Pennsylvania to throw out a pitch at the New York Yankees AAA Farm Club there uh, in Wilkes-Barre. Yeah. And the rail riders they are. And uh, Mike, uh, Aaron Judge was swatting them out of that park just a couple of years ago. Yeah. And, boy, that boy can crush it. It's amazing to watch the baseball bat. All rise. I saw some footage of Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig in batting practice the other day. I saw that, too. Did you see that? Yeah. Man, I, I saw that several times. I was like, yeah, Sultan looks like he might have got into some trouble the night before. <laughs> <laughs> you think? He did like hot dogs in his beer. You know, everybody knows. That's, that didn't give you a digestion. So <laughs> so anyway, I, as I was uh, at the ball game, right, um, I was signing autographs, of course, and I was sitting at the table, and the line was just forever. I'm like, well, the stadium was, the stadium was sold out. Yeah. And, uh I don't know how many. I signed autographs for innings, right? And they just kept coming. I'm like, man, it never stops. But there were so many kids that were 11, 12, 13 years old, and they all, you know, I thought, man, these kids don't know anything about this show. They're just trying to get an autograph. Right. <laughs> these little autographs, these little kids selling autographs on the Internet. Damn it. <laughs> so, oh, you know, it's true. Yeah, don't make that out to anybody. Just sign your name. Thanks. I can't sell it for as much as if you personalize it. Well, uh, you know, look, I was, like I said, I, I just couldn't believe how young these kids were because when we were on the air, you know, the thing, the reason NBC loved the show so much was the demographics. I mean, our show was number one among 
households with incomes of one hundred thousand dollars or more. Wow, that's called disposable income. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> you can go to the NBC Store dot com, and I want you all to do this. They're listening, Mom, Grandma, and your cousin Rick. I want you to go buy Vance refrigeration gear at NBC Store dot com. They have hoodies and sweatshirts and. So they were monitoring, NBC was monitoring all these people knocking it off early back in the day, right? They quit doing that. Now there's like five to ten pages of advanced refrigeration gear being sold by, you know, people breaking that copyright. <laughs> oh, great. You know, and people are even doing penguins. I mean, they're even trying to emulate the art now. And NBC's not doing any takedowns on it. So I'm surprised. Lots of entrepreneurs uh, hustling advanced refrigeration gear. I know I want, uh, you mentioned you threw out the first pitch for Scranton Wilkes-Barre. I, I do have a picture of that that I actually just showed on the screen. I want to get one of those Bob Vance uniforms. Is that for sale on NBC.com? No, no, that was a gift from the Rail Riders. Uh, they had two of them, and I they gave me one. I tried to snag the other one. They're like, no, we're keeping that one. <laughs> <laughs> Like, oh, are both of those for me? And they're like, uh, no, no, just one of them. Aww. So, uh, so I believe there's two in existence. Oh, that's great. Number 18, right? Uh, yeah, 2018, so that's why I had it. Oh, I was wondering if there was any significance to the number. Yeah, no, it was because it's 2018. Gotcha. Well, I have one last question for you, Bobby Ray. Yes, what sir. haven't you, you know, you've done a little bit of everything. What haven't you done? that you'd like to do in, as far as your professional career? Uh, cowboy movies. Oh, like a John Wayne type of role? Well, you know, I uh, do a pretty fair John Wayne, if I do say so myself. <laughs> Pilgrim. If you can't, if you don't want to be John Wayne, then who the hell do you want to be? Right? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I grew up, I, I, I love Wayne, I love Mitchum, I love... Lee Marvin, I like Charles Bronson. You know, I like all the tough, real tough American men that we used to have as leading men. Ah, I love those guys. Those guys were men, and uh, we need to get back to that type of filmmaking. Yeah, how about a new Dirty Dozen? You could, uh, I love the Dirty Dozen. You must have loved that, too. Well, it's so good. Ernest Borgnine is brilliant in that. He's and- great. Uh, everybody in Everybody in that movie, that's everybody at the top of their game. They're all in their prime. I mean, there's a a clip of Charles Bronson, and he's doing a movie called Hard Time. It's from 1974. He's 54 years old in the movie, and he is buffed, and he is kicking this dude's ass. <laughs> <laughs> I met him. I actually got to meet him. Oh. And, oh, yeah. I mean, I've met everybody. I mean, you know, for a kid from West Virginia to, to meet all these famous people. But I was never in awe of fame. You know, I think fame is absolutely the wrong reason to try to do anything. I just always, you know, just was a straight shooter with people. I mean, you know, they're not interested in me being awed by their fame. They're tired of their fame, right? Yeah. I mean, fame, look, after about five minutes of talking about The Office, we have to talk about other things, don't we? <laughs> absolutely, yeah. And fame is fleeting, and, you know, and none of us get out of here alive either, so. That's right. Interesting. So you want to be the in some kind of John Wayne movie. Well, if you ever do it, I want a walk-on role. Can, can you guarantee that? No, no, unless I was producing it. Uh, <laughs> you know, the actor has very little uh, say in who's in the movie. The director usually has the final say. But the producer, the, the executive producer can always beat people with the big boy wallet, you know. Um, it, it's touchy business. Uh, I was supposed to have been in Green Book, but really? the, the executive producer said no. So everybody else said yes, but he said no. Why? So I don't know why, because <laughs> I killed that audition. Oh. But, uh, no, my friend is the writer of it, Nick Vallelonga. He's from uh, New Jersey, New Jersey guy. Uh-huh. And uh, I'm really proud of him. Oh, yeah. I haven't seen it yet, but I heard it's a terrific movie. Uh, it's great. Anything with Vigo Mortensen in it is going to be good. That guy is a real deal. He's a great actor. Mahersha Ali is, is fantastic as well. Yeah, he's, a, he's got a statue at home. Uh, did you ever see the picture Eastern Promises? No. Vigo plays a Russian gangster in that, and, and there's, there's a fight scene in that movie that is, well, he's nominated for an Academy Award for it. But there's a fight scene in the movie that takes place inside a men's spa, inside a sauna. And Vigo is naked. Through, we're back to the naked. The yeah, here we go, we're naked again. Yeah. yeah, I can't stay away from 
He was <laughs> naked the whole the whole fight scene. I mean, I don't know how he did it. I mean, I watched <laughs> that scene. I'm like, man, that is brave. That is just ridiculously brave because uh, you know. It was not easy sledding this fight scene. When you see this fight scene, <laughs> it's a whole, you know, the thing goes on. It's not like it's over in a minute. It's like a twelve minute deal there. And I mean, when I see when I see scenes like that, I'm thinking about how hard was it to make it, right? Yeah. I'm through all the different angles in my mind. I love movies where I don't think about those things, right? Yeah. Because when I'm watching a movie, I'm usually dissecting it. Well. Screenplay says this, the, here's, here comes the cut, you know, because you're looking for timing involved in these things. Every now and then a movie, you know, gets you where you, like Dick Dixter will do that to all your listeners. When they watch it, they'll go, this is magic. This is movie magic. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they will. Oh, no, it's funny. If you like to laugh, you pull off a few stunts. You know, I thought, well, Dick Dixter's such an asshole, uh, that I'm just going to kick him in the nuts every chance I get. So I think in the movie, <laughs> you go to the well like six or seven times, you know. And uh, I was telling the, the, the editor, oh, I need a bigger sound effect there. <laughs> 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 so finally, the director is my cousin, Chris Ray. He's like, do you think we've done this once too, once too many times? I'm like, no, nah, let's do it again. <laughs> <laughs> so if you like watching guys get kicked in the nuts, uh, Dick Dixon might be your movie. Well, there you go. And I'm sure most of my listeners are that kind of person. So everybody listening, go out and find Dick Dixter, as you, as Bobby Ray mentioned. It's available in about 100 different places. And, and Bobby Ray, this has been a wonderful conversation, a lot of fun. You're a great guy. Love you on The Office, of course, and I know everybody else does. Love you and a lot of other things you've done, and it's been a real thrill to talk to you today. Well, thank you. And I do one more plug. Please, please. I'll do, I'll be in the upcoming movie it, with Zach Galifianakis. Yeah. The movie version of Between Two Ferns. Oh. I'm playing Zach Galifianakis' dad. No way. <laughs> Buckle up, kids. <laughs> oh, God, I can't imagine the two of you together. Oh, God, that has, that, that has Academy Award written all over it. Well, the first take we did, uh, we're... We're his family. We're at the dinner table. He's come over for dinner. We don't really necessarily love him so much. You know what I mean? Yeah. And because he's a weird dude. <laughs> he's a, have you watched Between Two Ferns? He's a weird little dude. So <laughs> the first take, we did 25 minutes. And there was not a cut to be heard. We just sat around and did our stuff. And we were killing them, you know, killing them. Yeah. So that's the kind of stuff I like to do where you get up from it and you go, what just happened? <laughs> yeah, yeah. What in the world just happened? Because working with that guy, you never know which way, where he's going, what he's mm -hmm. going to do. That's kind of like being locked in a car and somebody throwing a bobcat in there with you, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you defend yourself at all costs. That bobcat is coming. He's not good. <laughs> they did a great bit in, with that in uh, Ricky Bobby in the uh, Talladega Nights where they got him in that car with uh, with a cougar. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was gr that was such a funny movie. That was terrific. That's great stuff. That is great stuff. Get into the car with the cougar. You gotta overcome your fear, boy. <laughs> <laughs> so we can expect a little bit of that kind of flavor in this movie. Well, you, one never knows. You know, I mean, uh, I, I know what we did, so we'll see what, how it ends up. But uh, you know, he's a very funny guy, so uh, I really liked working with him. Oh, he's great. He's very, very funny. In Steve Carellville land, right? Yeah. They're, they're like geniuses, right? Absolutely. And of course, they have uh, a lot of freedom. You know, uh, when you're the star, you have more freedom to do more things. And so that translates usually uh, to bigger and better things. Absolutely. That's why I'm hoping you get to do more projects like Dick Dixter, where you're... Uh in charge of everything. And that that's when you can give me the uh, walk-on role. If you can't do it in a Western you're in, I, I want you to write something, produce it, direct it, star in it, and then I can get my walk-on. Oh, yeah, no, I, I've i already got it. For you. It's, it's called Highway Patrol, and I'm going to kill you with a shotgun. So uh, enjoy. Oh, fine. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. I'd love to die in a movie. <laughs> <laughs> Your gut shot, boy. It's like it hurts real bad. Prepare to burn. 
<laughs> oh, I love it. A, a little catchphrase goes along with the death, huh? That's great. Always, always. You got to have the seed enders, and you got to, you know, if you look at Dixter, you'll see every scene in. And first of all, there's a fight in every scene, right? Right. But you'll you'll see there's a one liner to get in and out of every scene. Yep. <laughs> I love that. That's yeah, terrific. That's how it's well, once again, Bobby Ray, this has been an absolute blast. I really enjoyed talking to you. I want people to check out Dick Dixter. I want folks out there to start binge watching The Office if you've never seen it before. What kind of person is that? Yeah, yeah, I know. What kind of per- a, a crazy person? And I'm thinking, that's right. That's so yeah, either 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 nuts or just too young to have seen it before. But if you haven't seen it, well, watch it again. I'm sure most of the people have seen it, but binge watch it again. And also go to Cameo.com if you want a fun little video shout out. I highly recommend that as well. I wish you much luck, my friend, and thank you again. Thanks, sir. I appreciate it. Stay warm. Oh, I'll try. You, you too, I guess. <laughs> All right. Take care. All right. Bye. Bye. I'd like to thank today's guest, Bobby Ray Schaefer, for a wonderful conversation. You know, my friend, it doesn't matter whether we call you Bobby Ray, Robert, Dick Dixter, or even Bob Vance, Vance Refrigeration. Because no matter how you slice it, you're a terrific actor and a hell of a guy. And I wish you nothing but the best, my friend. Watching television, watching television. We hope you've had a dynamite time listening to this edition of Bill's Pop Culture Podcast. Join us again next time for another Stroll Down Memory Lane. Until then, let's be careful out there.